we are going to start a new topic today and it's all about uh, motion originally and we'll get very very good at describing how things move and this is how physics began um, three or four hundred years ago by looking at um, the natural world how physical objects interact with each other um, and it began with uh, watching and charting and explaining and so you have uh, records going back to you know the, the Mayans and the Aztecs uh, thousands of years ago were very very good at predicting the motion of the stars and the planets because they had just observed and recorded so very very well and so we're going to begin with observing and recording uh, how things move and we're going to develop our vocabulary so that we're able to properly and efficiently describe the motion of things and that'll take us three or four lessons and then when we're very very good at, ex at describing how things move we're then going to turn our attention to describing uh, to explaining sorry why they move the way they do why is it that when you pick something up and let it go it falls back down to the ground again um, why is it that when one object uh, collides with another object they rebound in the way that they do so we're going to um, use various tools to explain why things move the way they do uh, we'll begin with the concept of force which you've met before and i'm sure you're familiar with a little bit at least and then we'll use some other techniques as well um, because sometimes uh, it's cumbersome and complicated to explain motion using uh, the concept of force. Sometimes some other um, concepts are more useful and get to the correct answer more quickly. So you've also probably heard of energy and uh, you might be a little bit hazy on what it is and how it works, but we'll talk about that uh, some more during this topic as well in an effort to explain why things move the way they do and then we'll also uh, have a look at um, some other things like um, momentum which is something else you might have heard of but might not have properly developed your understanding of so this is going to be uh, quite a long topic in the way that electricity was quite a long topic um, and it's going to take us a while to get through it might might take us to the end of this school year we'll see how we get on and uh, it's one of the bigger areas of physics. So in terms of what is physics, uh, maybe a third of it, pushing onto a half of it, is all under the umbrella of what we would term mechanics, which is the, the, the what, why things move the way they do. So it's a big topic, big chunk of physics, um, an important part of physics, and we're going to begin it today with this idea of speed and i'm sure you're familiar with speed we just need to lock it down and make it uh, rigorous and um kind of scientific in nature so that you can get the most out of it that you can okay so let's uh start with an activity first of all could you just uh list those things those eight things, could you list them in order of fastest to slowest, please? And don't rely on what you know. So obviously a car is probably going faster than a worm. Um, you, you can use a little bit of intuition, but for the, um, for the ones where it could go either way, I need you to look at the speeds that I've given you and try to work out which is fastest. Okay, here are the answers on the screen now just have a little look so as i said baby jake's at the bottom i just missed him off the slide um what what um the issue is here is that you were trying to convert between units that's what slowed you down if i'd have just given you the list in meters per second all of them you wouldn't have hesitated and you'd have banged those things out much quicker than you did. And so the, the first thing that I want us to note about speed before we get into anything is that a common unit really does help. So uh, science has settled on the meter per second and that's the unit that we're gonna use. Occasionally we'll slip into kilometers per hour but most of the time, for most of what we're going to do, when we talk about speeds, what we're really asking is how many meters are being traveled in one second. And once we've got a handle on the unit, we then are able to build a proper definition of speed. So if we're going to aim for our 
concept of speed to give us an answer in meters per second, then we can then understand the definition of speed. And this is the bit that I need you to note in your book. So hopefully you have, uh, while you've been waiting, you've put a big title, uh, motion or something like that, or, or exp uh, describing motion, explaining motion, something like that, describing motion. Um, and now your title speed, and this is the bit that I want you to write down. So a definition of speed is that it's the distance traveled in a certain time, and we are going to settle on uh, one lot of time. So um, just by a kind of agreement that the whole world has agreed that we're going to use the number of meters in a single second. Or, like I said, sometimes we'll use the number of kilometers in a single hour. Any of those speeds that I wrote on the previous slide are perfectly good speeds. They were just really difficult to compare to each other. So um, we're just going to agree this as, as a world so that we can all compare speeds with each other. Um, and we have played this game before in other topics. What happens if we know how far you've traveled in 10 seconds, not one second? Well, in that case, we just assume that the distance traveled was the same each second. So if it traveled a certain distance in 10 seconds, we just want a tenth of that. So uh, we did this with electricity. We're doing exactly the same thing with speed. So here is the formula. Please, could you put the formula in a box and make it look important. Uh, and you are going to be using that formula for the rest of today's lesson. So don't let it get far away from you. So uh, if you want to calculate speed, you take the distance traveled in meters and you divide it by the time that, that the, the journey took uh, and you make sure that's in seconds. And if you do that, and you divide a number of meters by a number of seconds, your answer when you get it will be in meters per second. Alternatively, you could use kilometers and hours, and then your answer will come out in kilometers per hour. But we're going to stick to meters per second today. So with that written in your book, speed equals distance over time. We're now just going to do some practice questions. Uh, what I want you to do is to put your answer, not the working out or anything like that. I just want to put your write a number in spiral so that I can see what answer you have got to this question. OK, here we go. Could you please tell me what the speed is of a car that travels 500 meters in 20 seconds? Just throw your answer out into spiral as soon as you've done it, please. And I am going to count down from 10. And you need to have given me an answer by the time I get to zero. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. One. So your answer is 25 uh, because you did 500 divided by 20. OK, what about this one? So take care with this one. So the speed of a car that travels 17 kilometers in 22 minutes. So the answer is coming in just under. 13. Just as a top tip, there are some of you that have been putting answers uh, in spiral that are kind of, uh, one of you got something like uh, 700 meters per second, somebody else got 0. 0.0000 something meters per second. Just do a, a little common sense check um, on your answers when you're doing um, calculations like this. Uh, it's a car, right? So um, it's not going to be traveling at 700 meters in a single second. That, that's seven running tracks in a second. Uh, equally, it's not going to be traveling at 0, 0.000 something uh, in a second because, you know, snails go faster than that. So um, try and think to yourself that if you take a pace every second, um, that's roughly kind of a stroll. 
two paces per second might be a, a kind of normal walking pace. Um, three or four might be, you know, practically speed walking, getting on for jogging. So um, a stride is around about a meter. So when you're walking, you're walking at something like one, two, three meters per second something like that. So uh, you just want to think to yourself, what would be a sensible speed for a car if I walk at two or three meters per second? So you're looking at a little bit faster than that, aren't you? So your answer comes in at uh, 13. And the reason that you, you get 13 is because you remember to uh, convert your 17 kilometers into 17,000 meters a kilometer is a thousand meters. And then for the 22 minutes, you need to remember that the um, every one of those 22 minutes has got 60 seconds in it. Okay, let's have another practice question and see how you get on with this one. Okay, so this time I'm not looking for a speed. This time I am looking for um, the the distance that is traveled. So you're gonna to have to rearrange that formula. Okay, so again, quick common sense check before you submit. Um, this is traveling 330 meters every single second. And I'm asking how far it goes in a minute. Well, that's longer than a second. So if it's traveling 330 meters in a single second, it must travel more than 330 meters in a whole minute. So some of you give me 5.5 uh, as an answer. And it's got to be more than 330, surely. Some of you are going with kilometers per second, controversial. Perfectly good unit though, as long as you write down what you're using. However, I am looking for a distance. So um, although kilometers per second is a perfectly good unit of speed, it's not a very good unit of distance. So it's 330 meters every single second and We're asking how far does it travel in a minute, which is 60 seconds. So it's 330 every single second for 60 seconds. So you need to multiply the two together. Comes down to your uh, rearrangement of this equation. So remember, uh, on the right hand side is distance, which is what we want, but it's been divided by seconds. And we don't want it to be divided by seconds. So to cancel out the divide by seconds, we need to multiply by seconds. So we need to multiply the right-hand side by time to cancel out the divide by time. But because there's an equal sign, we need to do uh, the same thing to the left-hand side, otherwise they won't be equal anymore. So if we're gonna multiply the right by time, we need to multiply the left by time. So we get a formula that says distance equals speed times time. Another way of looking at it, if you're more visual or um, graphical, uh, you can think about picking the time up with your fingers and plonking it on the other side of the equal sign. But if you do that, anything that was on the bottom needs to be plonked onto the top. So time's on the bottom. If you're going to pick it up and drop it onto the left-hand side of the equation, you need to drop it on at the top so it becomes a times. Right, you don't have to put these on spiral. I'm just going to give you three minutes to fill in the blanks. Just do it yourself in the back of your book or something like that. Scribble down the answers and we'll see how many of them you get in three minutes. Your three minutes begins now. So um, first one's 20, second one's 1400, then 0.2, 40. There's an example of the kilometers per hour. Um, Three seconds for that one. Remember to convert your kilometers into meters. And then eight minutes, 20 seconds. Does anybody want to unmute and volunteer to me why I made up such a weird uh, set of numbers for the last question? It actually is a real thing. Does anybody know what it is?
So uh, the light that's leaving the sun, it travels 150 million kilometers to the Earth, and it does so at the speed of light, which is exceptionally fast. We don't think there's anything in the entire universe that can travel faster than the speed of light. So that's kind of as fast as it gets. And it still takes light just over eight minutes to reach the Earth, which means that when you look up at the sky now and you see sunlight, um, that light, even if you look directly at the sun, which probably isn't a good idea, but even if you did, that light is not the sun as it is right now. That's the light that left the sun eight minutes ago. And in actual fact, if something really weird happened, like the sun poofed out of existence and disappeared, we wouldn't know for eight minutes, which is a really weird thought. Um, more on that in future topics. Okay. I said we were going to describe um, motion. Uh, and that's what we're going to do now. So we're going to uh, leave the definition of speed behind. We'll come back to it a little bit later on. And instead, we're going to turn our attention to things that are moving. And we're going to describe that motion. Now, um, if this was an English lesson and we were going to describe, I don't know, the Titanic sailing across the ocean, I'm sure we could write a wonderful story about this or we could go into uh, a particular genre like a newspaper or we could make a poem out of it. Um, drama, you could put together some kind of play, maybe sing a song. Music, you could write something for that to make it really emotional. Um, in art, I'm sure you could paint some wonderful imagery. And all of these things are very, very exciting, but ultimately not particularly useful. They're very lovely to listen to and watch and read and, and look at. And we would get a lot of emotional enjoyment out of these records of events. But if you were trying to predict the future um, accurately, none of those things would be particularly useful to do that. Um, and so if you were trying to work out um, what happened to the Titanic or uh, when it was supposed to arrive or anything like that, um, looking at a wonderful um, oil painting of it setting off from the docks um, wouldn't particularly give you much clue. So um, in physics, we have got an alternative. Um, it is not, um, unfortunately, as exciting as any of those other things. Nobody is going to uh, take a distance time graph and put it on their wall and look at it every morning and sigh with a little emotional response. That's not going to happen. However, if you were the captain of the Titanic and you wanted to accurately plot your course, uh, a distance time graph would be your preferred method for doing so. So we are going to describe the motion of things with a graph. Oh yes, contain your excitement. Now, I need you to be able to make a graph right now. So I have put onto Google Classroom this morning at half past eight, a PDF of a piece of graph paper. And I asked you if you could to print it. Now, I know that many, many, many of you will not have um, a piece of graph paper. Uh, you won't have a printer and you won't have been able to print it. So uh, there is an alternative. So I am gonna stop sharing um, my PowerPoint for a second, and I am going to instead share the alternative. I don't mind which one you use. You can either use the graph paper or you can use the electronic equivalent, which um, is coming up. Oops, wrong one. Coming up now. So uh, there is a link to the electronic graph paper on Classroom. So if you don't have a piece of graph paper, you just need to go to Classroom and you need to click on the link and you need to open up Desmos, which is a pretty wonderful uh, online graphical calculator. It'll draw you graphs of um, like y equals mx and things like that, but we're not going to use it for that today. We are just going to use it to plot a distance time graph. I know, contain your excitement. <coughs> right, I am going to give you 30 seconds. If you have a piece of graph paper, you need to stick some axes on it, like on my screen, that start at 6 a.m. in the morning and go up 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m., all the way up to midnight across the bottom. That's the time axis. Um, and then going up the, uh, the side, 
uh, we've got distance. Uh, we're going to actually do the distance in kilometers uh, today. And you just need to put an axis going up the side of your graph paper. Um, it doesn't really matter if you get to five or not. Just go up in one, two, three until you run out of graph paper. It doesn't really matter. Likewise, I can't remember how many squares you've got on a piece of graph paper. If you don't get all the way to midnight, it doesn't really matter as long as you start at 6 a.m. Um, those of you that haven't got graph paper, hopefully you have followed the link from Classroom and your screen now looks like my screen. You're going to have to toggle between the two. So um, have your graph paper uh, ready to go, your, your electronic graph paper, and then I'll just show you what I want you to do, and then you can copy it. OK, I am going to tell you a story. It is a deliberately silly story um, in the hope that you remember it. But it's not um, going to be something you need to remember forever. You just need to remember it until we finish doing this graph. Um, so here is the silly story. Um, all you need to do is when an event happens in the story, you just need to record where it was and when it was by putting a mark on the graph paper, but you don't need to record anything else about the event, just when it was and where it was. Okay, so let us begin our story. Our story is a Saturday. It's about um, a teenage boy or girl, maybe someone a little like yourself. Uh, let's call them Bertie, um, as I'm sure nobody in this class is called Bertie, so we won't offend anyone. And um, Bertie, it's a Saturday morning, is lying in bed. We are going to measure all distances from Bertie's house. So at 7 a.m. in the morning, Bertie is in Bertie's bed which is zero kilometers from Bertie's house. So if you're using the online graph paper, all you do is hover your mouse over the, uh, the black circle and then just left click it and hold down the left button and just drag one of those little circles and drop it onto the seven hours, but zero distance. And that's because at seven in the morning, Bertie is zero kilometers from the house. If you're using a piece of graph paper, just put a cross at the point of 7 a.m. and zero kilometers away. Bertie knows um, that this is occurring because Bertie's dog is having a good go at their face um, and woken them up. How rude. It's uh, 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Um, and Bertie goes straight back to sleep. The next event in our story is that it's nine o'clock and Bertie is still in bed. Bertie knows this because Bertie's mum has just opened the curtains and said to Bertie, shouldn't you be doing your paper round around about now? So Bertie uh, now has a second event of the day and you just need to put a little cross at 9 a.m. and again, zero kilometers from the house. Or if you are using the interactive one, just grab another dot and stick it on the nine point. <coughs> Bertie, in a mad panic, leaps out of bed, runs down the stairs, straight out the front door. He is late for his paper round, or she is, and bad things are gonna happen. Bertie quickly runs back into the house, puts some clothes on, um, and then dashes back out once more. It takes Bertie half an hour to get to the paper shop. And the paper shop is one kilometer from Bertie's house. So by the time Bertie gets there, it's half past nine, and Bertie is now one kilometer from the house. So you need to place a uh, another cross or another marker on the on the graph that you are developing. And this marker is now at half past nine in the morning, and it is one kilometer from the house. Now, I should say at this point that Bertie lives in a particularly weird village, and uh, the entire village is built along 
a completely straight road that starts with Bertie's house at one end and just runs off into the distance with all the other houses and shops and everything else strung along this very long straight road. There are no side streets, um, there are no curves, no bends, no hills. It's a very strange town that Bertie lives in. Okay, Bertie spends the next half an hour in the paper shop, partly this is packing the bag full of papers ready to do the round and partly it's being shouted at quite loudly by the paper shop owner who is a little bit irritated that Bertie is um, an hour late for work. <coughs> so at 10 a.m. Bertie is still in the paper shop um, but it's time to do the route. So could you just stick a, a fourth point on your graph, it's 10 a.m. and Bertie is one kilometer from home. If you are not looking at my graph, you might wanna just toggle onto it right now and just check that yours looks a bit like mine. To be honest, the details are not very important. And so if you happen to have your dots minutely in a different place, that is utterly fine. Okay, Bertie then starts doing the paper route and as I said, it's a big, long, straight road, and it just goes off into the distance. So as Bertie starts doing the paper route, um, he's just going to get, or she's going to get a little bit further from home. So as the time ticks on, Bertie just gets a little bit further and further and further and further away from home. And it turns out that Bertie's paper route takes them uh, to the three kilometer mark, and it takes them till two in the afternoon. Bertie's having a bad day, and maybe it wouldn't usually take um, four hours. No, yeah, four hours. That's a bad paper route. Um, four hours to travel two kilometers, but it's been stressful, um, and it's not a good day, and they're half asleep, so, you know, it's just taking a while. So at two o'clock, when the paper route finishes, uh, Bertie has traveled an extra two kilometers. So they were one kilometer from their house. They've now finished off three kilometers from their house. And it's two in the afternoon. Like I said, it's been a bad, bad day. Bertie finds a park bench and sits down. And Bertie is still on the park bench half an hour later. So at half past two, Bertie is still sitting three kilometers from their house. Bertie's tummy then starts rumbling and they think, you know what, it's time to go home. So they start heading homewards again, uh, which means they turn around and start walking the other way down the street. And after half an hour, Bertie has made it uh, half a kilometer back towards their house. So our next point is at three o'clock in the afternoon. And Bertie is now two and a half kilometers from their house. So again, if you need to, just have a little glance at mine to see if yours roughly matches it. As I said, it's a silly story. If you vary the details ever so slightly, it doesn't really matter. As long as you remember the story, uh, it's fine. Okay, at three o'clock, Bertie's phone rings. I would like you, please, to now finish your story. Who's on the phone? What happens next? Where does Bertie go? What you just must remember is that it's three o'clock in the afternoon and the graph paper runs out at some point. So your story needs to finish before you run out of graph paper. And also Bertie's uh, street, like I said, is particularly weird. Uh, you can't go anywhere that's not on Bertie's street. So you can go all the way back home to zero if you want, or you can go further away from home if you want to until you run out of graph paper vertically. It's up to you. But what I would like you to do, please, is put some more crosses on your graph paper until you run out of graph paper. Could you just finish off Bertie's day? Who was on the phone? The only important bit here is that you remember the story. I am going to give you two minutes to fill up your graph paper with more crosses. Two minutes. Off you go. So uh, on the screen that I'm sharing with you, 
Uh, I've just put the rest of the points on the graph paper. And in my head, I've got a story to explain what's going on. Um, hopefully, yours will look something like this. Um, it's not going to look the same because you made it your own story, but it should be a load of dots sprinkled all over your graph paper or crosses. Um, if you're using the interactive one, just glance to the left-hand side of the screen and just check that you haven't accidentally moved your points into a weird order. Um, the X column needs to be um, in order. So mine starts at seven and finishes at 20, 23 and a half, uh, and they go up in order. The next bit is gonna go wrong for you if you've accidentally pushed your points out of order. So just make sure that your X column goes up in order. Shuffle the points around if you need to. Okay, I need you to pay very, very close attention to the next little bit that I say. Um, for the last um, four years, you've been uh, studying science and you've been occasionally doing some experiments that have resulted in data, like the table of results that are on the left-hand side of my screen that I'm sharing with you. And you've plotted countless graphs over those four years. And you know what happens next. What happens next is we're going to put a line on it. And the golden rule always is you're not allowed to play dot to dot. You must draw a smooth line or curve of best fit. And I need you to deeply understand why that is, because we're about to break the rule. And you need to understand when it is acceptable to break the rule and when it is not. So if this was a regular experiment, say uh, we've got a thermometer sticking out some water and we have um, randomly, you know, heated up the water, then let the water cool down then heated up the water and let the water cool down. <clears throat> and then uh, this is the set of points that we've resulted on. Um, what we would assume is that the Bunsen burner kind of, I don't know, uniformly heats up the water so that the temperature rises gently and falls gently. Um, that's what temperature does, right? You don't make yourself a cup of tea and it's uh, at 80 degrees one second and then you turn you back and turn, turn back to it again and two seconds later it's suddenly at four degrees. That, that doesn't happen. Um, with temperature. It's a smooth, continuous change. If it was at 80 degrees, it then goes, you know, 70, 60, 50, 40. It doesn't jump around all over the place. And if we had got some data that suggested that the cup of tea was 80 degrees, then it was four degrees, then it was 70 degrees, we would quite correctly assume that we'd made a mistake. It can't go 84, 70. The four is clearly a mistake. We measured it wrong or we've written it down wrong. And so we'd identify it as an anomalous point. Um, also, random errors happen all the time. So, you know, even if we were measuring accurately and it was going, you know, 80, 70, 60, 50, um, we might measure it a little bit early or a little bit late. And so what should have been 70 might be 71 when we actually write it down. And so when we draw our graph, we have to remember that because the data is measured data and measured data is subject to mistakes and random errors that we have no control over, um, and that our measuring devices are never perfect, we always have to remember that every one of our dots is ever so slightly in the wrong place. And we're allowed to nudge the points in our imagination to ask ourselves, what would be the lovely smooth line that the dots would sit on if they were going to sit on a smooth line that represented whatever it is we're measuring? And we remember that, you know, each of our dots is nowhere special. Just because I chose to take the temperature at two minutes and then the temperature again at four minutes and then the temperature again at six minutes, I mean, that's just me being a little bit um, uh, needing to be in control of the time. I could take the temperature at one minute, 57 seconds if I wanted to. I don't have to do it at two minutes. There's nothing special about the times at which I, I record data. And therefore, it wouldn't be right for the graph to change direction at this random time. If, if the temperature is going to do weird things like jerk around all over the place, why should it do it at the random time that I decide to take the temperature? 
it's just not realistic. So the graph's not allowed to change direction at the points. There's nothing special about the points. They're just, just random um, collections of data. I could have picked any point. <clears throat> so the rule is ordinarily with measured data, you have to draw a smooth line and any points that look really out of place are anomalies and should be ignored. However, that's not what we just did. We didn't take data at random points. We took data at very, very, very special points. These points are special. They're when Bertie's dog was licking his or her face. It's when Bertie was being shouted at in the paper route. It's when Bertie was sitting on a bench. It's when Bertie's phone went off. Um, these were specific events that really were special and really did happen at those times and really aren't anything to do with errors. And therefore, these points cannot be moved. They cannot be declared anomalous. And things really did change at these events. The graph really will change direction at these points because Bertie's behavior changed at these points from sitting on a bench to, to walking home, to doing the papers, uh, to, to answering the phone. Things really did change at these points. And therefore, we really are going to change the graph's direction at these points. Likewise, I have told you all of the interesting things that happened in Bertie's day, which means that if I didn't tell you what happened at 12 o'clock, it's because nothing interesting happened at 12 o'clock. And therefore, there is nothing special happening between the 10 o'clock point and the, and the 2 o'clock point. So we're just going to use straight lines to demonstrate that nothing interesting happened between the points. So if you're using a piece of graph paper, a, a paper piece of graph paper, I need you to, and this is the only time in your life I will ever invite you to do this, so enjoy the moment. I would like you to join up the dots uh, with a ruler and a pencil playing dot to dot in order, please. I am never going to ask you to do this again, so enjoy this moment. If you're using the interactive one on the screen, you need to watch me for a second. You need to click on the gear wheel up here. Then you need to click on the black dot next to the Y. Then you need to click on the toggle to turn on the lines. So gear wheel, black dot, lines. And then you can press done. Gear wheel, black dot, toggle on the lines. OK, what you have on the screen in front of you in all of its wonderful glory is a distance time graph of Bertie's day. And we don't usually put titles on our graphs, but I think today we deserve one. So at the top of your piece of graph paper, could you please write distance time graph of Bertie's day? If you do not have a piece of graph paper and you have been doing this on screen, you need to make a sketch of this in your book. So just draw yourself a pair of axes, very, very roughly put um, a scale on each axis, very roughly. You don't have to be very accurate about it and make a sketch of the crosses and the straight lines and then give that one a title. Um, now, we've run out of time, so I'm going to leave you to do that little activity, and we are going to pick this up at exactly this point next lesson. So I need this to be done and waiting in your book uh, for tomorrow's lesson, please. 